When, I was, when we were listening to Omar last night, one of the things he was talking about was this idea of a scene of a crime, which I think is a very useful tool, actually, to think about the, the conditions that we probably all work under today. It's like Walter Benjamin always used to say that we're, we're working in a state of an emergence, emergency, and I think that that's really quite true. But the, what Francesca was referring to, as I was telling you when I came out of the airport, in Cairo yesterday, I was waiting around because, of course, they didn't know which door to open and which plane they were going to get us on, and et cetera, et cetera. So there's that kind of lag time where, uh, you know, sort of, I, I get the feeling in airports that people are, are reinventing the wheel. That it's like the first time they've ever actually flown an airplane and so on. Because you, you go through this incredible sense of, oh, they've never done this before. But so as that was going on on the music, they were playing yesterday. And, and you, so you could hear this booming voice saying, you know, yesterday all my problems seemed so far away. Today, they, and so on. So I, I realized that it, it sort of could be the theme song for Egypt uh, yesterday. So, um, but I've, I've discovered over the last couple of years this, this notion of the revolution in a square, a circle in a square, and what that means. And of course, there's a history of revolutions in squares and a history of the ways in which. Uh, uh, various people have responded to it. And so what I'm going to read to you is just a very short part of a much longer paper where I've uh, dealt with four major pre-revolutionary artists in Egypt and re relate them to um, pre-revolutionary literature in Egypt, which is among some of the best modernist literature you can read. You can read most of it in translation, Ibrahim and Muf um, 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 Kazari and, and so on, and it's it's an extraordinary sort of body of literature of, of cynical uh, sarcasm, hilarious sort of Kafkaesque kind of things. And so I was relating that to that, and also of course to the, the labor struggles, particularly the lawyers and the judges prior to the revolution, that the revolution didn't just happen overnight, spontaneously, there were about five or six years of really intense protests in different parts, different sectors of the, of the country and of the, of the um, of the politic uh, of the, uh, the 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 civic body, and uh, so that kind of notion that, that it was just this Facebook revolution that happened overnight and so on is not true. Although there were tipping points, and those tipping points included Khalid Saeed being battered to death by the police in Alexandria in December and so on. But I, I sort of start to look at the art as being symptomatic of the the crisis in the regime. So. I'm going to show you and talk about that, but I'm also going to relate it to Francis Solis in, in the square in the Zocalo in Mexico City in 1968, just as a reminder that this is a kind of ongoing cyclical thing of, of revolutions and the role that art plays. And I'm not trying to say that one work of art is better than another or that one is um, aesthetically better than another, but I really am interested in, in reception theory and the way in which, despite people's intentions, only certain works of art actually become effective, and other works of art, um, you know, fall into a, a, a different kind of class of, of effectiveness. And this all comes from Marcel Duchamp's idea that, you know, the artist can stand on the rooftop and yell that he, he or she is a genius, but unless the audience responds to it, um, in fact, they're, you know, they're, they're like the tree falling in the in the forest with nobody to hear it. So in December of 2009, a young woman named, um, two years before the recent Egyptian revolution, a young woman named uh, uh, Amal Kandaway did a performance entitled Silence of the Lambs, uh, staged in downtown Cairo. And this performance piece was intended to signal the official opening of a gallery exhibition at Townhouse Gallery, which is entitled, appropriately, Assume the Position. Um, Kandaway led a few friends and children who had volunteered together with about 12 paid performers in a slow, literal crawl across a major downtown intersection, remarkably stopping Cairo's legendary frenetic traffic. <clears throat> Eager to get beyond elitist gallery spaces and to bring art to the widest possible audience, Kenaway had conceived a series of pieces to be formed on the streets of Cairo, of which Silence of the Lambs was just the first. Intended only for the residents of the neighborhood, and unsuspecting passers-by. This performance was nevertheless also witnessed by a number of people from the arts world um, who were alerted to it by the townhouse announcement. And out of courtesy, Kenaway spoke to a few key residents about her project 
just before beginning it. Expecting something familiar like a, a studio film set, uh, as Cairo produces the majority of films and television shows in the Arab world, uh, the residents seemed receptive. But the performance began and was videotaped, and when no big budget movie cameras materialized, skepticism as to Kenaway and her fellow performers and their intentions quickly boiled to the surface. In Silence of the Lambs, and this, you can see this in the videotape, um, a shop owner followed by another very aggressive man accosted Kenaway and her performers. More <coughs> onlookers soon joined these two. All of them were irritated or angered by her apparent deception and distressed by what was no longer a familiar and predictable scenario. What had been seen and enacted was interpreted immediately as an insolent public gesture. And this, of course, is highly appropriate to be talking about this today when tear gas and stones are again being thrown in Cairo tonight um, with, because of a, an insolent public gesture and a representation, supposedly a representation of the prophet. So they didn't really know if it was art or politics. Had they been deceived, was Kenaway really an Egyptian, was one of the questions. And so an almost violent confrontation ensued. And the usual conspiracy theories erupted into accusations ranging from prostitution, that Kenaway was clearly a prostitute, to the more common hidden foreign plots of exploitation, to the idea that there's always some kind of conspiracy. If anything moves in a slightly different direction, there must be a conspiracy. My favorite conspiracy in Egypt, when I arrived, was that a shark had bitten a woman in the Red Sea at Sharm el Sheikh, and the shark was actually a Mossad trained shark. And <laughs> the evidence for this was that it was an older German woman. <clears throat> so, um, a small throng of captivated yet outraged spectators confronted both the artists and the performers, and by the time the police arrived, the atmosphere was very hostile and volatile. A number of the performers were ultimately investigated by the police authorities, including, of course, the artists. Whereas Francis Lees walked the streets with a very real 9mm gun through the streets of downtown Mexico City for 11 very long minutes in a piece called Reenactment before being stopped by the police. His performance was remarkable for either the indifference of the audience who saw him or the social fear as no one did anything to hinder his progress. This piece is also remarkable for the police's complicity in a reenactment of the performance immediately upon being asked to do so after initially arresting Elise. Elise shows the original and the reenactment side by side in exhibitions. And if you saw his um, one person retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art recently, the two of them are shown side by side. So retrospectively, the, the piece Silence of the Lambs stands as an acute foreshadowing, what I would call a symptom, of some of the issues taken up by the uprisings in January 2011. The question at the performance's core that was immediately pounced upon, almost literally, by the surprised audience was whether it was about humiliation or whether it was an act of humiliation in and of itself. In other words, was humiliation its theme or its result? Is humiliation its ends or its means? The crowd instinctively honed in sharply on this uncertainty, in one might say a very certain kind of way. In Francis Elise's work, the accidentally, the sort of the street audience that was equally kind of accidentally formed didn't intervene despite the obvious illegality and even danger of a man striding down main urban streets brandishing a gun. In Egypt, on the other hand, everyone available seemed to have had an immediate and loud opinion of the performers' actions, and they backed up their opinions assertively and vigorously, even to the point of the risk of a brutal outcome. In, in an environment of censorship, which held sway officially at that time in Egypt, that is 2009, when Kenaway had the piece performed, Silence of the Lambs has become a kind of touchstone of debate in the local art discourse in the last two years. And public humiliation was definitely one of the more central themes of the revolution as well, if not the single most important one, after decades of, of you know, repression. Again, Elise working in Mexico City 
provides a clear, a clear cultural comparison. His video, oh, that's back to Kenway, sorry. His, his video, um, Patriotic Tales, I should actually show you that one. That's actually the people crawling across the street and holding up the, the traffic. That's a, a documentary photograph from, from a tower above. Um, so his, his piece, Patriotic Tales, uh, 19, 1997, sheep are added one by one in a circle, following the shepherd, him, around a flagpole in the center of Mexico's main square, the Zocalo. And the piece is notable for its minimalist approach and a lack of a visible audience. Yet this is despite the fact that this particular Mexico City site has hosted past protests, government brutality, and even mass murders as well. Just like, like the now famous Tahrir Square in Cairo, where at least 800 and some odd people lost their lives to assassins in the first couple of weeks of the revolution. But Elisa's video act video acts as a kind of iconic metaphor of complacency and conformity in a charged space that is now historical, not contemporary, uh, <clears throat> uh, at the time of his production. The historical epicenter of public assembly, where a sinking cathedral now stands on the site of an earlier Aztec pyramid of the Sun Temple, the Zocalo, is infamous for the despotic massacres of October 2nd, 1968. On that day, 10 days before the opening of the Summer Olympics, police officers and military troops shot into a crowd of mostly unarmed student demonstrators. Tanks then bulldozed through and over the panicked protesters. Thousands were beaten and jailed, many people disappeared never to be seen again, and hundreds of bodies were trucked away. The numbers of martyrs and deaths is still unknown due to the continued secrecy surrounding the documents. Kenaway's work, however, immediately accessed the violence of both the popular and the famous book and film, after which it is named, The Silence of the Lambs, and caused an immediate reaction that was as unruly as it was consequential. It should be said also that Elise's video <coughs> arrest, unlike Kenaway's, was the anticipated outcome of his performance. Both videos of which, as I mentioned, were included in his retrospective. These are just some of the pictures from Mexico 68. Probably I'm the only person in the room old enough to remember this, but nevertheless. <laughs> so I could also mention things like Andre Serrano's Piss Christ, which was used to almost bring down the National Endowment for the Arts in Washington, and to the, which to this day gets vandalized by ultra Christian thugs, most recently this year, or Pussy Riot, of course, and their <coughs> recent jailings, a group whose understanding of an aesthetic strategy is now legendary. The aesthetics of using the church to erase a kind of icon, as Malievich had done originally with his first <coughs> black painting, installed high in a corner. This Russian case is a kind of continuation of a deep understanding of sight as political, uh, as well as intentions. But in each case, I think I'm arguing that it's not because the works of art are political in any sense of intention necessarily, but because of the reception of their works by audiences, both official and unofficial. Elise's work could have offended, but it didn't. Works of art like Gerhard Richter's Bader Meinhof paintings are easily accepted into museum culture, as is Hans Hacke's destruction of the floor of the Albert Speer designed and Mussolini Hitler commissioned German pavilion at the Venice Biennale. They are acceptable images of insubordination, or they can be authentic. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. Or they can be authentic sites or acts of civil disobedience. But their power lies not so much in the eye of the beholder, but in the power structure of the beholder it offended. So it is not the content that makes something scandalous or politically effective. It's the way in which it's taken up the way in which it works, and I think this is what Duchamp was talking about. There is, of course, a fundamentally romantic reason that it is artists who often feel the most contempt for those in power, and even more so for those who misuse it. Around the globe, the arts are perceived as a great quasi-mythical narrative force for freedom in the, in the modern period. From the role of, the, of institutional handmaiden of the wealthy and the religious centuries ago 
the arts have in the last decade, the 20th century, become a powerful, unregulated industry that at least champions the rhetoric of freedom over repression and expression over suppression. The arts have evolved as a counterforce to the large and daily injustices within overly <coughs> governed lives in many cultures. Regardless of the eventual fate of the 20th century avant-garde's absorption into and embraced by mainstream media, the arts remain for many the fabled, the imaginary space of individual rights, particularly when the state deliberately and routinely suffocates public discourse and human rights or free speech. No wonder authoritarian administrators abhor everything from rock and roll and rap to graffiti. No wonder the arts are the first item to disappear in a reduced budget and the first activity to be censored by insecure authorities left and right. The arts have a power far beyond the actual and legal power of any individual artist whose citizenship or even life is always just as vulnerable as anyone else to authoritarian dictates. But as revolutions are acts of imagination, if nothing else, artists are often at the forefront of the renunciation of past values. The very lack of regulation in the arts makes them de facto radical in a world of laws and decrees. So it is this, still this uncontrollability of all forms of symbolic capital that authoritarian regimes desperately fear. It is this symbolic capital which they try to manage and suppress, if possible. Billboards with Hosni Mubarak's portrait were torn down on day one of the revolution in an act of tremendous courage and insubordination. <coughs> Shoes were pressed against images of Gaddafi as the Libyan uprising began. Ilgazma, the shoe, being the lowest insult in Arabic. And from day one in Egypt as well, Al Jazeera, the Qatar-based CNN Arab equivalent, had continuous 24-hour coverage of events in Tahrir Square and all over Egypt. But it was only when Egyptian national television, many, many, many days later, and still very reluctantly, showed Tahrir Square with an image that matched the one on Al Jazeera, that the revolution was formally acknowledged in the people's media. Until that time, Egyptian national television had, when not recycling pop popular reruns, been showing serene-like Nile-side scenes. So control of public distribution of such imagery is, of course, one of the great muscles of power. In order to maintain power, certain social exclusions are judged necessary for the public sphere. And non-representation is one successful method of rendering certain images <coughs> invisible and mute. Not having been represented by powerful media is a form of deliberate social injustice. I repeat that. Not being represented by powerful media is a form of deliberate social injustice. State media exercise a kind of apartheid of imagery, mimicking non-representation in the political sphere. Icons are understood as potent forces, and even today, proper iconography, that is to say image writing, is still of great import to institutions of power. In America, you will remember that the mass media waited two and a half weeks before reporting on the Occupy movement, probably hoping it would go away. So the iconoclash, that's a nice term, the iconoclash that Bruno Latour writes about is alive and well. Thank you.